The prophetic, uh, the, the prophetic anointing that was on it just really, um, in, in fact, I was praying that God would give, a, give me a word to encourage people today because I just feel like the body of Christ needs encouragement. Wouldn't you think we need encouragement? <laughs> You're definitely not going to get it watching the news, for sure. <laughs> but I just felt like, okay, I, I just need to, I was praying for the Lord to give me a word of encouragement. And I, I felt like I wanted to share this in this segment of the service. And so, I, um, anyway, Drew saying a lot of what I was going to share, which is really, I love when that happens. But the scripture the Lord gave me, it's uh, turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 12. And I, I, I do, I just, I do want to encourage you today. Uh, and, and I want to encourage you from Isaiah chapter 12. We're coming into a time when the Lord himself must be everything for us. I mean, he must become our everything. And if we're looking to the world for peace and if we're looking to the world for joy, if we're looking to the world for strength, we're going to be sorely disappointed. The Lord himself must become that to us. And I, I'm so grateful, Drew, saying about that in our worship today is so spot on. The Lord himself is our joy. The Lord himself is our peace. The Lord himself is our strength. And even when I woke up today, I just woke up. I don't normally wake up with joy. I usually have to fight for it. I usually wake up like groggy and melancholy or whatever. But I, I woke up today just filled with joy. You can ask Angie. I came down and just, she got up before I did and I started annoying her just with the joy. But anyway, just really felt the joy of the Lord today. And I even, you know, with, you know, Bill Furler, everyone remembers Bill Furler. He used to come here and he used to say that, you know, I'm not going to try to imitate him, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. I don't know if you remember that, but that was in my mind this morning when I woke up. And I just, I really do believe God wants us in this time we live in to draw from his joy in us. We have the joy of Christ in us. We have the peace of Christ in us. We have a full salvation within us right now, already, because of Jesus Christ. In your spirit, you have everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have everything pertaining to life and godliness already inside of you. Now, Isaiah chapter 12 says, uh, verse, verse 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. God is your salvation. You, I will trust and I will not be afraid. Okay, how many of us need that right now, don't we? I mean, looking at what's going on in the world. I will trust God and I will not be afraid. I will fear God and I will fear no one else. I will not look upon what is happening in the world, what is happening in the nations. I will not be, I, I, I will not be afraid. I will trust God. Listen, for the Lord God is my strength. God is your strength. You don't have strength in and of yourself that is of any value to the Lord. Your own human strength is an obstacle to God. And God is your strength. God is your song. That's where God, that's where the Lord is bringing the church right now is we, th this whole thing of trying to find joy and pleasure in external circumstances is kind of going away some. And God himself must become our strength, must become our peace, must become our joy. And so God is our strength. God is our song. He has become our salvation. Now, here's what verse 3 says. Therefore, you will, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. I love that. This is not something we're going to do in eternity, yes, it is, but it's something we can do right now. We can go down into our human spirit where Christ dwells, that within your spirit is everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything that Christ is, is in your human spirit. His joy, his peace, his wisdom, his strength, his power, his anointing, his mind, his knowledge, all that Christ is, is in your human spirit. And so God wants to teach us in this time we live in of shaking, when everything around us seems to be shaking, and, you know, it's like you think it couldn't get worse, and you read the news the next day, and it gets, seems to get worse. So everything around you is shaking, but God wants you to know that inside of you, in your human spirit, is 
Christ. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to feel sad and gloom and like your best days are behind you. No, Christ is in you. And if Christ is in you, he is your joy. See, you can have human soulish joy that comes from your own soul, or you can have the, the joy of Christ that comes from your spirit. And God wants to teach us that the, the soulish joy comes from external circumstances. The joy of God, the joy of Jesus Christ comes internally no matter what is going on around you. And so we've got to get to that place where no matter what is taking place around us, we can now draw from the joy of God that is in you. Draw from the grace of God that is in you. Draw from the peace of God that is in you. See, you have everything pertaining to life and godliness in you. It's about learning to draw that out. And I just got this sense when we were worshiping today. Is sometimes I feel, I feel like some have even been saying, whether online or here in person, you almost like, gosh, I wish we could go back to like, you know, dad always says the 50s. Well, I don't even know what that means. But go back to, for me, it's like 2005 or, you know, whatever. Just the, the good old days for me, 2005, you know, kind of in between after 9-11 and before the 2008 crash of the economy. You know, life was really good. Go back to 2005, you know, it's like, you know, not many stresses, not many cares. I was younger, had more energy, you know, you kind of think like that. You want to go back to the good old days. And even some have been going like, if we could just go back before 2020 when all this stuff started happening, this decade of decades is now unfolding right before us. If we could just go back to the good old days. And I just felt like the Lord put on my heart to encourage us. No, you were born for this time. Don't look back like Lot's wife. Don't look back to the good old days like Lot's wife and she was turned to a pillar of salt. You were born for this very hour. You were born for such a time as this. God destined you to live in 2022 at this time. And even though it seems as if the end of all things is at hand, which Scripture says, and I believe the birth pains are definitely intensifying and increasing, we can't go back to the good old days. God has prepared us for this time. I just want to encourage us with that, that we would, in this time, we would take our responsibility. We would be, like, like Paul said to the Philippians, be a light in a crooked and perverse generation. How many of you realize we're living in a crooked and perverse generation? I didn't realize it could be that bad, but it just seems to get worse and worse. And I'm not going to dwell on that, but I'm just going to say, in this perverted time we live in, when they're trying to push all kind of filth from the pit of hell upon the children and upon even the adults, is I am, we are going to be a light that shines in a perverse and a crooked generation. Amen? We are going to be salt that preserves the culture from decay. We are going to be salt and light. We are going to be a demonstration of Jesus Christ to a world that has gone mad. So I want to encourage you, don't run from the hour we live in. Take your place in the fight and the battle. Heaven, the great cloud of witnesses are looking upon us, applauding us, encouraging us, I think even envious of us, in this time we live. And I, I do believe that even the great cloud of witnesses will look down on us with some envy and say, man, I wish I was alive at this time. Let's take that this time we live in and let's run our race with endurance, the race that is set before us. Amen. And then the other thing I wanted to share during worship <clears throat> is I thought Drew just so uh, uh, really beautifully expressed in worship that the, the, the Lord's word to us for this time we live in, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. You know, in the midst of all the shaking going on right now, God, the word of the Lord is heaven is my throne 
The earth is my footstool. Where will you prepare a place for me to dwell? And the answer would be, it begins here in the heart, and it flows out from the heart into the corporate of this body of Christ, living stones fit together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, that was my encouragement to you. So, I'm going to, I'm going to get my, into my message in one second. Just two quick announcements. If you did not um, receive the articles, if you did not see the two articles I released last week, it was going to be my message from last Sunday, but of course we got sick and weren't able to preach. But it was the answers to your questions, or uh, I think there was 10 questions that were asked. If you didn't see that, if you didn't read it, just go to RadicalPursuit.net, RadicalPursuit.net. There's two articles, Are We Living in the End Times and what, uh, How Do We Understand uh, Russia and Ukraine Related to the End Times. I don't encourage you to read those. Um, I, I really, it's important that we understand those. You, you ask some awesome questions, and, but it's really important that we understand those. So just really want to encourage you, if you haven't read that, to read that. We need to understand those things. And then the second announcement is the, we're doing that, remember, the, we're doing that Life School fundraiser. We're trying to raise 28 uh, laptops for pastors because we want to train and equip them. And we've already raised about 23 laptops. We've got about five more laptops to go. So we're doing awesome. And just want to say thank you so much for the way you have given generously. It's just been amazing to see. Uh, you know, even, even though things around us are swirling and everything is uncertain, just the generosity that is in the body of Christ in this time, we want to, we want to just keep pressing on. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't given yet, if you haven't given to this, I want to encourage you to, to really seek the Lord about giving to this. Whether it's you provide a full laptop for $600 or you provide just $50 or $100, you know, I think all of us working together, whether you're online, whether you're in person, all of us can hit this goal of 28 laptops. So I want to encourage you to do that. Let's, let's hit this goal of $18,000 that we're trying to raise. So you can give, obviously, traditionally here, writing a check or uh, with cash, or you can give online. The address, the URL is give.lifeschoolinternational.org, give.lifeschoolinternational.org. So just anyway, I want to encourage you to give. So amen. That was my rant. Now the message. I'm going to, my goal here is to preach this message in about 45 minutes, which would be a miracle. So... <laughs> But I, I want to talk today about divine order. You know, we have, we have four couples getting married this year, which is an, an incredible record for a church our size. We're not a big church, as you know. And four couples are, are getting married. I think I scared them by all this in-time teaching, and they're like, Jesus is really coming back. Man, we better hurry up and get married. So, um, so anyway, this, it, it's pretty incredible to see how God's moving to see these couples get married. And so we're having a marriage seminar after church where we're going to really try to give them our wisdom. And so hopefully, you know, hopefully we got some wisdom to share. But um, the message I was going to share is about divine order. And I just felt like when I was praying just to share it on Sunday. And it's not really, you know, it's not just for if you're married. It's, it, it applies to every part of our life is God is a God of divine order. God is a God of divine order. And so you just think, you just look around and the world is in chaos. Well, the world is in chaos because God's divine order is not established. See, God wants to bring divine order, and that divine order begins in the human heart. There is no divine order apart from Christ having divine order within you, where he occupies your heart where he owns your heart, where he is Lord of your heart. And then that divine order flows from your heart into your home, whether you're married, whether you're not married, whether you have children or don't have children, but divine order comes into your house, into your marriage, into your family, and then into the church, and finally into the world, which I don't think the world is going to have divine order until Jesus comes back, but God wants to begin right now in the human heart, flowing into your family, flowing into your marriage, flowing into uh, your, the church. And so, as we talk about this, 
you know, if you, we're going we're gonna to talk about two uh, specific areas today. Number one is divine order in your heart and then divine order in your marriage. So whether you are married, want to get married, about to be married, uh, never ever want to be married, I still believe this message can apply to you for sure. Because if you think about it, we are the bride of Jesus Christ. So whether you're not married or whether you never want to get married or whatever, it still applies to your relationship with Jesus Christ because marriage is meant to model our relationship with Christ. And so I just want to encourage you as we read through this to think about this. So here, here's the issue we've got going on right now. Here's the problem we have right now. As you know, the world is in chaos. The world is spinning out of control right now. And it, it all comes down to a lack of divine order. It's just the world has gone mad. Chaos has landed. And so the Lord's remedy for this crooked generation is to bring divine order. To bring divine order starting in the heart, moving into the marriage, flowing into the family, going into the church, and then from there impacting the world. That is the way God moves. And so I want us to look at here some scriptures Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter's talking about divine order in the heart. Everything we're talking about begins in the human heart. Everything starts in the human heart. Is Peter's, Peter's talking, and he's actually talking about marriage if you read the context of this chapter. But he says to us, and I, I believe this is the key for every marriage, every family that's in divine order, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. That word means to set Jesus Christ apart in your heart as Lord. There is no divine order until Christ is truly Lord of your own heart. And I don't mean just saying, Lord, Lord. I mean actually obeying Jesus in what he says. I mean surrendering everything you are, all that you are, every part of your being down to your tiniest thoughts and emotions surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that he would conquer your heart. That's where divine order begins. That self would be dethroned and Christ would be enthroned. That Christ would be Lord and self would be dethroned. Divine order begins in the human heart. If we're going to have divine order in the marriage, divine order in family, divine order in church, ultimately divine order in the world when Jesus returns, it begins in God's people truly, truly allowing Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your heart. We're going to dive into that in a minute. Another scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, talking about marriage, we see also divine order. No, let me read actually 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, is we see here God's plan for divine order. Paul is saying, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, is actually means, the, the Greek means a wife. So he's not talking about man over woman. He's talking about husband over a wife. Divine order is Christ is the head of the man. The man is the head of a wife. And, and God is the head of Christ. So even in the Trinity, there's divine order. Even in the Trinity, the Father is the head of Christ. Christ is submitted to the Father. Yet they are perfectly one, and they're perfectly in divine order, and they flow perfectly in unity together. There is divine order even in the relationship between the Godhead. And there's divine order in the home, divine order in the church. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. It's one of the all-time favorite verses of every husband that's ever lived. Ephesians 5, and as all the wives go, oh, Lord... But there's this part you got to remember that as Christ loved the church, so you got to do that part. But here we see divine order. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. 
Now we'll flip over to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And I want to hear, encourage every kid in here listening. Hear this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is a commandment with a promise. It actually says, it actually promises you long life and blessings when you obey. So there is divine order in the heart. There's divine order in the Godhead. There's divine order in the marriage. There's divine order in the family. And now we look at Ephesians 1, verse 22. It talks about the divine order that exists in the church, that Jesus Christ is head of the church. A pastor is not the head of the church. An apostle is not the head of the church. Though God appoints pastors and apostles and fivefold ministry, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 1.22, he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Amen? And now finally, one other verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And I'm just going to go ahead and read this. You can, you can turn there, and if you make it in time, that's good. But God has appointed in the church, I want you to see the divine order in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. So just to kind of recap right now is the world is in chaos. God's remedy is divine order. Divine order begins in the heart, then flows from the heart into the marriage, from the marriage into the family, from the family into the church, and then from the church into the world. Now, again, I am not expecting divine order just when I read scripture I am not expecting divine order to be established in the world until Jesus comes back. I just don't see it in Scripture. But I do see divine order in the heart, in the home, in the church, and then the, then the church influencing culture with that salt and light. So now let's talk about divine order in the heart. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is a Scripture we've talked about a lot is, Paul says, now, now may the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my point in saying this scripture is, it, you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. A lot of times we don't, and we've talked a lot about that here, but we don't really think a lot about our human spirit. We think about our body because we can look in the mirror and go, oh, Lord. And we can feel pain. And we can know we have a soul because we get angry or jealous or mad or whatever. We have emotions. We know we have a soul. We have rational thought. But our spirit is so deep inside of us that a lot of us don't even, even know we have a human spirit. So the Bible, Scripture comes along and brings a light into us and says, you have a spirit. And divine order begins right there in your human spirit. Because in your human spirit, you have Jesus Christ if you're born again. In your human spirit, Christ is joined to your human spirit as one. Your human spirit has been grafted together with the God of all creation. The very God who raised Jesus from the dead. The very God who created the universe lives within your born-again spirit. Your spirit is now one with the creator of heaven and earth. That is incredible. In fact, Paul was talking about that in 1 Corinthians 6 in the context of marriage. And he said, just like a husband and wife are joined together, you, your spirit is joined together as one with Christ if you're born again. That means you are never far from God. See, if you say, I'm, I just feel far from God, you're basing your closeness to God on an emotion or a feeling, not on the truth. You are connected spirit to spirit at all times with God, if you're born again. You are not far from God. 
He is not distant. He is right in your human spirit, connected to your human spirit as one. Everything we do related to divine order flows out of that reality. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, grafted together. And I've given the illustration when I lost my thumb in a skiing accident, how they had to put a skin graft onto my finger because they had to take skin from here and put it on my thumb. But I can look down at my finger and see this skin graft and realize that is what it's like to be one with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is grafted to your human spirit. That means everything that's true about Christ is now true about you. You have a well of salvation in your human spirit. You have his peace, his joy, his faith, his goodness, his kindness, his self-control, his love. Everything Christ has and is, everything Christ has experienced, his, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his enthronement, his overcoming victory, now is in your spirit because Christ is in your spirit. Everything you have pertaining to life and godliness is in your human spirit. Paul said that if we will receive the abundance of God's grace, which is the power of God in your human spirit, given to your human spirit to enable you to be who God's called you to be and to do what God has called you to do, if we receive that grace and we receive the gift of righteousness, then we can reign in life. See, you're meant to reign in life. You're not meant to be defeated. You're not meant to just grope around, depressed, discouraged, and anxious. You're meant to reign in life by the power of Jesus Christ inside of you. See, divine order begins in the spirit, and it works itself out. See, Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Working out your salvation doesn't mean doing more for God. It means... What God has worked into you when you were born again, into your spirit, needs to be worked out into your soul, into your heart, into your thinking, into your emotions, into your desires, into your motives, into your beliefs and all that makes you you, into your personality. God himself from your spirit permeating and saturating every part of you so that now Christ in you lives his life in you and through you. That's divine order. Divine order internally is spirit first, soul second, and body third. If we get the order out of place, it's going to mess everything up. That's why the church is so out of whack right now is because we become carnal or soulish. See, when the spirit is first, you become spiritual. When the soul is first, you become soulish. That means you're ruled by what you think. That means you're ruled by what you feel. That means you're ruled by how you, what you want instead of by the Spirit of God who lives inside of you. When your spirit is first, you are spiritual. When your soul is first, you're soulish. And when your body is first, you're carnal. See, God wants to bring divine order into the church by starting within you in your spirit, and then working into your heart and soul. Amen. The strongest part of your being will determine what part of you leads and lives. So when, you're, when your body is the strongest, that means you're going to be dominated by cravings. When your soul is the strongest, that means you're going to be dominated by what you think and feel and want. And when your spirit is the strongest, that means your spirit is going to be led by the Holy Spirit. That means the flowing of God internally inside of you flows outward into your heart, and then into your soul, and then into your body, and outward into this world. That all relates to, mar to marriage. It relates to the family. It relates to the church. If we don't get divine order in Inside, internally, we'll never have divine order in the home. We'll never have divine order in the marriage. We'll never have divine order in the family or in the church. Everything begins by you yielding to Christ and letting him live rather than you. 
See, whoever dwells in your heart, whether self or Christ, will be the life source from which you live. If self is living in your heart and dwelling in your heart, enthroned in your heart, where you get what you want, when you want it, and how you want it, that means Christ will not be living in you and through you because Christ in you will be suppressed. Christ in you will be dormant because you're blocking the life of Christ from being released by self-life. Because self is on the throne. I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it done. And so if we're going to have divine order, self must be taken off the throne and Christ must be enthroned. Christ must be king of your heart. Christ must be Lord. He must have everything about your life or you will not have divine order. You will be soulish or carnal rather than spiritual. And so if, you're going to have, if we're going to have divine order, God's solution to the present crisis we're living in, if we're going to have divine order, it begins in your own heart. Amen. You'll never have it in your family. You'll never have it in your marriage. You'll never have it in the church until it begins here in your own heart. So literally, I could, pre, I could write a book about this. Oh, wait, I am writing a book about this. Literally, we're going, to spend, we're going to spend about four months uh, talking about the subject because it's deep, but it's so, so vital. I, I've, I've, I've already written uh, my first draft. Uh, this is what I told some friends yesterday is that when you're writing, the first draft is primarily for you to teach you, and the second draft is for those who are going to read what you wrote. I'm on my first draft, and I'm like, man, I've, I've learned so much, and I can't wait to share about that. So anyway, you definitely want to make sure you're a part of that class that we're going to do at church. It's going to be for like four to five months, and we're just going to go deep in this subject. Very, very important. Okay, so now moving on from the heart to the home, we're going into divine order in marriage. Again, if you're not married, don't say, well, this doesn't apply to me. Yes, you can look at it and apply it to your relationship with Christ. If you're not married but want to be married, you can say, okay, I want to learn about this for when I do get married. So don't zone out and think it uh, doesn't apply to you. Okay, so one of the reasons why God created marriage is to model the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. That's exactly what Paul said in, in Ephesians chapter 5, is the relationship of, of Jesus Christ and the church is modeled in human marriage. And so that is what, you know, there, there's many reasons for marriage. There's many reasons God designed marriage, but one of those reasons for marriage is God allows in that dynamic of a husband and wife in marriage to model the relationship between Christ and the church. And so, but here's what's really interesting is the relationship between Christ and the church is actually modeled after God the Father and God the Son's eternal relationship before time and creation. Let me explain what I'm talking about in this is, is if you go, and I wrote about this in the eternal blueprint, that in, the, in eternity past, God was the lover and the son was the beloved. And so, you know, Jesus said, the fa said to the father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. God was the lover and the son was the beloved. The father poured out his love upon the son and the son received. And again, this is a, a deep mystery that we all can't comprehend fully. So don't feel like, oh, I don't understand. I don't understand. I'm talking about it. It's, it's a mystery. The scripture talks about this. And the son then, as the beloved, responded back to the father in this incredible flow of intimacy and unity between the Godhead. And as we just saw, God the father is the head of Christ, and Christ is submitted to the father. But the father is the initiator of love, and the son is the responder of love back to the father. And there's this incredible unity and symmetry and this organic relationship between the father and the son where the father is ahead, Christ is submitted to him, but they are equally together as God as one, flowing in unity, flowing in intimacy, flowing back together. Now, in that relationship in eternity past, in a mysterious way, the, the son was somewhat like Adam. He was the responder to God's love, but he was not the initiator of a beloved to a beloved. And so God, in his eternal plan and purpose, 
designed the concept of marriage to show that Jesus Christ would have one day a bride where he would be like the father in their relationship. He would be the initiator of love to a beloved, and that beloved would receive that love and respond back to Christ. And that's why he put Adam into a deep sleep. He was modeling God's eternal plan and purpose for what he wanted within a, human, within a people who would have his life. And that, fore, that foretold of the marriage between Christ and the church. And when the second Adam was on the cross and that Roman spear pierced his side, just like Adam in the garden when Eve was taken out of his rib, out, of, out from his rib, that spear pierced and blood and water flowed out to create the second Eve, the church. The blood being the, the redemption that is found in Jesus Christ and the water being the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit would form a new creation that would have God's life in them by the Spirit of God and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and that new creation would then become the bride of Christ, the church. And marriage represents that dynamic. Isn't that beautiful? Of what marriage is and what it means and what it is from God's perspective. And so even in the, even in the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, there is divine order. God is the head, Christ is submitted. God initiates love, the son responds in love. In marriage, the husband is the head, and he initiates love, and the wife responds in love, submitted. Now, I'm going to talk about this. Let me just say, as we talk about divine order, a couple, couple things I want to make sure we understand. As I talk about this in marriage, okay, I'm not going to be able to go through every single complicated nuance of how to handle a spouse who is an unbeliever, a spouse who is not spiritual, a spouse who is abusive, okay? Those, those would require entirely different sessions to talk about, okay? So I know I'm not going to cover every single nuance that could be talked about. I'm mainly talking here about uh, just, just from an introductory standpoint of what marriage is and what divine order in marriage is. So let me just first say what divine order is not, okay? What divine order is not? So those about to get married, uh, the, the, just nudge your future husband in the rib right there. Say, listen carefully. Okay, divine order in marriage is not like a marriage in Saudi Arabia, shaped and formed by Sharia law where the woman has no rights and the husband is her master. Okay? That is not divine order. That is not divine order. Okay, divine order in marriage is not a gullible wife blindly submitting to her husband even though he is abusive, whether verbally, physically, sexually, or spiritually. That is not divine order. Divine order in marriage is not male dominance and control where the wife is obligated to obey every command from her husband who lords over her. That is not divine order. Divine order in marriage is not a husband commanding his wife, in the name of Jesus Christ, woman, submit to me, because the Bible said so. That will fail if you try that, trust me. I tried that a couple of times when we first got married, and yeah, that did not work good. I advise you, don't pull that card, because, you know, you, you know if you're getting married, you'll, I'm sure you will get into different kinds of fights. Hopefully, they won't be like the fights we had during our first year of marriage, but you will get into fights and you will be tempted to say, you are supposed to submit to me because the Bible says so. That will not go well. So if you're going to learn anything from me, learn that. Don't say that. Don't pull that card out in marriage, okay? What divine order in marriage is? Divine order in marriage begins with the husband who models Christ. Okay, catch this, okay, guys? By the husband who models Christ, listen, not by imitation, but by incarnation. Okay, make sure you get that. Because we, if we try to say 
I want to model my life after Jesus Christ. What would Jesus do? And I try to do what Jesus would do. Externally, you're going to miss it. Because you can't live his life. Only he can live his life. You're not meant to model his life by imitation, but by incarnation. That is by from the inside out. That is by Christ himself living in you, his life through you. That is the only way you can live like Christ. Only way. That's why I spent that a bit of time there talking about divine order in the heart. Is you cannot try to imitate and do what Jesus would do, you will burn out. You can't do it. You can't do it by external compliance or behavior modification. That will not work. It must be an organic flowing from the inside out as Christ becomes your life that you live by. So husbands, your first thing, if you want woman submit to me, is you, obviously you're not going to get that, but if you want that, I mean, not that. If you want divine order, it begins with you living by the life of Jesus Christ. Not your own soulish life, not your own carnal life, the life of Christ. Him becoming incarnated within you and possessing you and, and filling you. See, divine order as God intended involves the husband becoming Christ-like in these areas. A servant of all who serves his wife. Okay, I know you're looking at me, Angie, like, well, you need to do that. Yeah, probably. I got a little convicted, I got to admit, writing this. We don't, we're not perfect, okay? So we are, we're, we're way more better than we were when we first got married. But this is a learning process. But truly, divine order will not come into your house until you as the husband become the servant of all, like Jesus. He was the servant of all. Serving your wife is how, and I don't mean serving your wife just in the natural strength. I mean serving your wife out of divine life. Serving your wife as the servant of all, the servant of the house. See, if you want to be a leader, it starts with, if you want to be a leader, the greatest among you shall be the servant of all. So, wives, if you get into an argument with your husband, you could say, this isn't working because you're not being the servant of all. Okay, don't try that either. But it really begins with the man becoming the servant of all, becoming like Christ who served all. It becomes with the husband as a living sacrifice who takes up his cross daily and sacrifices for his wife. Again, I need work there. Why are you, why are you, you're grinning at me like, yeah, you're really a little hypocritical right now. No, I'm just kidding. I know, I wrote this like going, man, I need, I need some help. I need some help. So we don't have this mastered. After almost 23 years, we still don't have this mastered. We're moving in that direction way more than we were. Uh, the husband is the initiator of agape love, Okay. Agape love, expressing Christ's love in and through him for his wife. And I'm talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm talking about love is patient, love is kind, love is not seeking its own. Love is not easily offended or provoked. You'll really need that one, okay? Love is not irritated or ground to powder by the other's personality traits. Though I don't really have many, but... Angie has a few. Um, the spiritual leader. See, God wants every husband to be a spiritual leader. You're meant to be a leader, a spiritual leader. Okay, that doesn't mean you're, okay, as the husband, you've got to get the first revelation. Okay, you're in this competition. No, I'm the leader. I get to get the first revelation. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means you are going, you are living out of the presence of Christ. You're the priest who is going into the Holy of Holies to get the word of the Lord for the way he's leading you and your family and your marriage and the way he's directing. That does not mean the wife is not getting that too. She is. It, the way it should work, the way it works with us is we just, I mean, I don't think any of us ever go like, okay, no, I disagree anymore. Well, I mean, sometimes, but um, the way it should work is that you both are coming together. And yeah, that's what the Lord's speaking to me. That's what the Lord's speaking to me. It's not like the husband's going into the Holy of Holies and the wife's over here in the outer court and you're going, woman, like Moses, 
you know, the Lord says, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. You're both going into the Holy of Holies, but the husband, you want to take the lead in that. You want to make sure you're doing it for her. I mean, I don't say first. You're, you got to make sure you're doing it. And it doesn't mean if your wife isn't doing it. I know when we first got married, I was, I, I called it quiet times, but I'm not sure God was really there. Um, especially why my attitude was towards Angie. But anyway, I would spend a lot of time reading the Bible and praying, and Angie would not spend quite as much time, and I used to judge her for that. Do you remember those days? Yeah, she did. She still has a few scars from that time. But I would judge her. I was so bad. I was terrible, okay? I was terrible. I had a religious spirit on me. But anyway, I would spend two to three hours reading, praying, and I would judge her because she might spend five minutes or ten minutes. Or I mean, She was not really at that time interested in spending time in the Lord's presence. And so I would judge her, and I'd be like, you need to be reading the Bible. You need to be, you need to be praying. You need to be blah, 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 whatever. And so anyway, that is not what I'm talking about, okay? So the husband needs to model it. Now Angie is like, now she's pushing me for real. She's pushing me for real. But it, it just happens organically as the husband takes the lead and models it. The, the husband wants to model this. Now, it doesn't mean the wife can't, but the husband is meant to be the leader who models this. Um, and also the husband is the leader of the house. Now, th that, when I say this, uh, hear what I'm saying. That doesn't mean you have to lead everything. Okay, this idea that the husband has to lead everything is just not biblical. For me and Angie, Angie's really good at finances. She's really good at practical things. I'm off in, you know, la-la land and all these theories, and she has all the practical wisdom, and I don't have much at all. So she, she leads so many things in her house, for real, the finances, all that stuff. And, but I'm still the leader of the house, and because, but she's leading these things. And we flow together out of our strengths and weaknesses. I know my strengths, and Angie knows my weaknesses. I don't really know my weaknesses, but she knows my weaknesses. And I know her weaknesses, and she knows my strengths. And so we flow together by knowing, okay, I, you know, as me as a leader, I'm saying, Angie, you lead the finances. You lead all this other stuff, and we'll flow together. I mean, now we don't even, I don't think we ever think about divine order or submission or any of that. I don't think we ever, ever even think about those things in our marriage. It's just an organic thing that happens now. We're a team that leads together, and we, we, I, we never even think about divine order now. Now, that wasn't always the case. I'll share that in a minute. But that was, you know, so divine order is meant to be an organic thing that happens naturally by the life of Christ. It's not meant to be forced or complied or uh, forced or, or pressed upon to try to make this happen. If you're trying to make divine order happen, it ain't going to work. It's got to come from Christ being the life of the husband and the life of the wife. Amen. Okay, so... Divine order is only established through the cross. And so I'm going to share, I'm going to share a story. And I, I know it's, you know, sometimes people have heard my story. Sometimes they haven't. But when we, when we were about to be engaged, it was 1999. And I was working in Alpharetta. And I wanted to get Angie, you know, I knew, we, we knew, okay, we're, we're going to get married. God's put us together. There's no doubt about it. And I want to get her something before I actually... Ask her to marry me. So I was working. It was in December. I still remember the day. It was cloudy. It was cold. It felt about like yesterday, but just cloudy. And anyway, I was like, okay, where can I go to get some jewelry? And so I asked my manager, and my manager said, there's this place called James Avery Craftsman. You can go, and you can buy jewelry. And so I went in there, and I just remember being in a really bad mood. I used to be in a bad mood a lot, didn't I? Yeah. I was in a really grumpy mood, but I was like, okay, Lord, show me what to buy for Angie. You know, I was like, you know, grumpy, like, okay, show me what to buy. And I'm surprised, actually, God answered my prayer. But I went into, this, I went into the store, I saw this showcase, this jewelry showcase, and I saw this cross pendant. It was a gold cross pendant. And I, was, and I just knew immediately. I mean, there wasn't light shining down or an angel going, you know, pointing to it. But I just knew immediately, okay, I've got to buy that. I just knew, okay, this is what the Lord wants me to buy. And so I buy the cross pendant, and then that, I think that night I give it to her, but I said, okay, Angie, this is not an engagement ring. This is not an engagement ring. And I, and I, 
And I'd written up this whole thing of, uh, it was kind of like the cross being the central thing of marriage. Uh, you've got to die to yourself, and you've got to take up your cross in marriage. Anyway, I gave it to Angie that night, and she started freaking out. She was like, oh, my gosh. Did you talk to anybody? Did you talk to my mom? I was like, I mean, I've talked to her before, but I didn't talk to her about this. So anyway, she says, three years ago, I went into James Avery Craftsman, and I saw the exact same cross pendant. But, but the one I saw was silver, but I wanted gold. And I said, let the man that I'm supposed to marry buy this for me. So we were like, okay, God has definitely called us to get married. And I remember I gave her this, I forgot, I wrote this packet up. I, you know, I'm, I was writing even back then. So I wrote this thing up about, about like the, the cross being the center of, uh, and I wasn't talking about like what Jesus did for us, more of you got to take up your cross. And I knew God was going to call us to crucifixion. And Angie back then just rolled her eyes. I think she realized later I was a little more prophetic than she thought. But uh, anyway, just really showing the, the, ne the necessity of the cross in marriage you're not going to survive marriage without the cross. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're married if you think that's true. So if you want to have a blessed marriage, it's going to require you dying a thousand deaths. You know, sometimes we think, okay, you know, kind of the Lord deceives us and not deceives us, I'm kidding, but we think, okay, marriage is going to be this awesome thing, and, you know, guys have one thing on their mind. It's not the same thing girls have, but they think that's going to be all that happens in marriage, and girls think there's going to be nonstop back rubs and foot massages and all this stuff, and God's up there in heaven going, <laughs> yeah, right. He's like, I'm putting you together to die. Both of you, now, I'm, now when in that, you experience life and the most incredible blessings, but if you're married, you know that the other person will sand you and chisel you and crucify you a million times over until you're conformed into the image of Jesus Christ and the Father is smiling at every step of the way. Like Francis Frangipan said, both God and the devil want you dead, but for different reasons. God wants you to die, and that's the only way marriage can work. It's the only way divine order can happen is through the cross. You dying a million deaths and you being the instrument for your spouse to die a million deaths. Amen. So, anyway, it's more, it's more incredible than that. But if you, don't know, if you know that going in, okay, if you know that going in, it will save you so much heartache to be like, okay, God has uh, called us to the cross. Okay, so now, here's what I want to say is before Paul gets into the subject of marriage, I want you to see this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. It's the first verse. A lot of times when we're talking about marriage, a lot of times when we're talking about marriage is we don't really read verse 21. And the husband just pulls out, wife, submit to me. And, I, and if that ever happens in your marriage, I want you as a wife to pull up Ephesians 5, 21 and says, no, we're to submit to one another. Look what it says. Before marriage, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Divine order, the wife submitting to the husband, flows out of, first, the husband and the wife being submitted to one another. See, that's not taught very much, but it's very, very important. In divine order, I'll just say for me and Angie, in divine order, I am submitted to her, she is submitted to me, but I am, the, I am the head of our house. And it's not something we ever even talk about. It's just, it's, just, it's just, we both know that, but it just flows naturally. But I'm submitted to her. She's submitted to me. It's mutual submission with the husband being the final head. Does that make sense? So it, it's not like this male domination or this male control or this Middle Eastern marriage where you're saying, woman, do everything what I say. No, it's mutual submission with the husband being the head established by God. And so that, that divine order takes place as the husband steps into the role and leads the way God intends. 
And, I, and it just, what it does, it motivates the wife to come into divine order as unto the Lord. Like Paul said, wives, be submissive, submitted to your husband as unto the Lord. Now, I know in our first year of marriage, uh, that was a test for us. Let's just say <laughs> that was a test. You know, when we've told about that, you know, we've been married almost 23 years. 22 years have been awesome. First year of marriage was really rough and I won't go into all the details, but let me just say divine order does not happen easy, okay? It doesn't have, no, I'm saying it didn't has, doesn't happen easy. It might happen easy for you. It didn't happen easy for us. I mean, it was, I had issues. Angie had like one or two issues, but I had many, many issues, like a thousand, and she had like one or two. Um, but, you know, God takes those things and brings you together to bring in that organic order, that organic divine order. It's meant to be an organic process. I'm not, I won't go through all the details. You probably have heard that story. But the, the, the thing I want to end with is marriage really is living stones fit together. And the Lord, just like as in the church, the Lord is fitting us together as living stones. He's chiseling, he's sanding, he's crucifying, he's putting to death, he's raising up to life, he's blessing. Now, I don't want everyone to think it's all death and it's miserable. He's blessing, he's, uh, you know, releasing his blessings. I mean, marriage is an incredible thing that God has designed. But it is living stones fit together and that the cross is a, is a necessity for this to work. Is you, and especially when you start having kids, is, you know, marriage and kids will crucify every little thing inside of you. <laughs> it will expose every single thing in you. <laughs> Y'all are laughing because that's so true. Okay, so anyone not want to get married now, that's fine. I mean, no, I'm kidding. But any internal issue we have, so I want you to hear this, especially if you're about to get married, any internal issue you have, it could be a million things, pride, control, lust, judgment, bitterness, unworthiness, jealousy, unbelief, anxiety, fear, worry. I mean, you could just rejection. You could name a whole list of things. Whatever internal issue you have, you carry into your marriage and you affect your spouse. Eventually, I mean, if you're married, you know that's true, right? So that doesn't mean you have to get every single thing cleaned up before you get married. I mean, you would never, no one would ever get married. But God will have a great way of surfacing up things that you did not know were even there. So when you're by yourself and you're living on your own, you're living independent, you don't even know these things are there. God gets you married, and then, boom, all these issues start coming to the surface. You're like, I didn't even know that was there. And the Lord's like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's been there your whole life. But these issues, these, these, whatever those internal issues are, that God wants you to, to deal with your own stuff. Okay? Marriage is not going to fix you. If you think marriage is going to be the, the fix to your issues, whether it's low self-esteem or rejection or whatever, lust or anger or whatever, you think marriage is going to fix that, you've got another thing coming. Marriage is not going to fix that. Marriage is going to bring it up to a whole new level of intensity and exposure. That's why you have to go to, to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because God, God will join a husband and a wife together as one, and he will use those things that come up to mold you and make you into the image of Christ to drive you back to his son that you might live by his life. Amen. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to paint this like negative picture of marriage, but I do want to highlight to you it's not, you know, your, your honeymoon will last for maybe a week, two weeks, six months, but the honeymoon season does come to an end, and when it comes to an end, things start surfacing, and that's where the cross is needed. And I, I'm saying this to say, 
I want you to have the best marriage you can have. I want you to have divine order the way God intended it. I want the Lord to bless you and, and to bless your family and to see you just having an awesome marriage. But this, I, if, if I could offer one thing of advice, this would be mine. It's the very thing I said to Angie when we first got married. The cross, taking up the cross, is essential to having a blessed marriage and divine order is you dying daily to yourself and your self-interest so that Christ can be formed in your marriage. And so sometimes even, you know, in some different cases, some people might even need deliverance uh, through strongholds that have been surfaced as well. So don't, you know, try to shy away from that. If God exposes things and it's more than just a flesh soul issue you're dealing with and it, it's actually demonic, you know, get deliverance because otherwise you're going to affect your spouse. So if, if the Lord's bringing that up, get deliverance, you know, get deliverance if that's required uh, to in your particular situation. So anyway, bring this to a close. God has a in this present crisis we find ourselves in of chaos, God's solution is divine order. Divine order begins in your heart. And then from the heart, as the husband and the wife, as they both are living by the indwelling life of Christ, and the husband's taken that lead to be that spiritual leader, the initiator of agape love, the, the leader that God's called him to be, the servant of all, as, as the husband takes that lead in that role, then organically you will come into that unity and that uh, divine order God intends. And so anyway, we're going to just wrap that up by saying this. Is God designed marriage to, ex to be an example of Christ and the church? The marriage supper of the Lamb that's coming if you're married, then you are modeling that right now. And if you're about to get married, you're about to experience the ultimate wedding that God has planned, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. And so we'll end there. Father, we do pray that, Father, in every area you would bring divine order. Lord, you would bring divine order into the house. You would bring divine order into the heart. You would bring divine order into the marriage, into the family, into the church, Lord. That, Lord, in any area, Lord, where divine order, where we are out of alignment, where the order is out of alignment of what you intend for this to be, Lord, you would, you would reveal it, you would expose it. And Father, you would just bring every single one who are listening, Lord, you would bring us into that divine order, Father, starting internally as we say Christ Jesus is the Lord. Lord, be the Lord of our heart. Be the Lord of our heart, the Lord of our mind, the Lord of our soul. Be the Lord of every single area that we would live by your life and that, Lord, we might truly come into this unity that you have established. Lord, order in the home, order in the family, order in the church. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we'll end church online here. Okay, now I want to say what I really was wanting to say. Just kidding. I think we're going to end there. So just, you know, on your way home, say a prayer for the, uh, the couples that are going to be being counseled by us and uh, pray that we would give them some good advice and good counsel as we uh, share our stories of joy and crucifixion and <laughs> just kidding. But anyway, just be blessed as you leave and uh, love, you all, love you all and have an awesome week and we'll see you next Sunday. See? <laughs>